Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Excellent, excellent. Well, it is good to be here with you. Um, we also just want to say a special welcome. If this is your first time with us, if you're a visitor with us here at Gateway, we want to say a special welcome to you. We are glad you are here, and uh, we'd love to get to know you. We'd love to shake your hand afterwards and um, maybe even answer any questions that you have about who we are at Gateway Christian Church. And so uh, we would love to meet you, but we want to say a uh, special welcome to you. Um, we are going to be in First John chapter 4 today. Not the Gospel of John, but First John chapter 4 today, and so if you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to get there in a moment, um, but before uh, we jump into the Word, let's go ahead and uh, have a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, uh, for your glory. Uh, God, but uh, this morning we want to pause and just reflect um, and thank you for your love, uh, God, your faithful and unending love which knows no bounds. Uh, God, we just thank you for that. We thank you how you have shown us that love through sending your son uh, to come and live a life here as a human, but to give up that life um, on a cross. Uh, so, Father, we may be, uh, be reconciled to you. So, God, thank you for showing us what real love truly is, and God, may we uh, learn to express that love, to uh, soak up your love, and to show that to those around us. Uh, God, thank you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Uh, well, we are talking about God's character in this series, uh, God's nature, who he is, and what he is like, and also uh, what that then means for us as followers of Jesus, what it means to uh, walk in the image of God, how he has created us and who he has uh, created us to be. And so we're going through um, different character traits, different um, aspects of God's character throughout this series. But apparently um, last week there uh, was a little controversy regarding the sermon um, from last Sunday on what Laura and I did um, regarding my son and his swimsuit from church camp. Um, if you uh, weren't here, we were talking about the goodness of God, how God is good, um, but the tension that that um, plays out between uh, living out justice and showing mercy. I told the story about my oldest son um, and how a couple, two or three years ago, he forgot to pack a swimsuit for a church camp. And so uh, my wife, Laura, and I had to decide um, what do we do? We kind of struggled with this tension of what does it mean um, to be a good parent? What would a good parent do? You know, WWGPD. And uh, so we're trying to figure out, you know, kind of wrestling with this uh, question. Um, do we allow him to face the natural consequences of his actions um, or do we um, show grace instead and figure out a way to uh, send him a swimsuit? I actually got um, several questions this past week um, about it. Um, so a lot of people uh, came to me and they're like, well, there's a question regarding the sermon. I mean, I know oh, God is good in the, in the Bible and Jesus and stuff. And that, but, but what happened with the swimsuit? Um, so um, I... Uh, and, well, and I understand, too, because, you know, we've got to find out what's this new preacher guy like. You know, is he this iron-fisted dictator that just, you know, loves, you know, relishing and the discipline of his children? Or is he, you know, this relaxed, you know, carefree, free-spirited anarchist with no respect for discipline? It's got to be one of the two. So, so what happened? Well, I am happy to put an end to the misery. Um, since he has always uh, shown such a great responsibility um, in his life, and Lord knows I have made my share of mistakes in my lifetime. And so we decided um, that probably what was best in that situation was to show grace and mercy. And so we figured out a way for uh, my sister who lived close by the camp to be able to go pick up a swimsuit and bring it out to him. And so uh, Aunt Rachel to the rescue, his camp was saved and uh, all was well in the universe. So that's how the story ended in case you are wondering. Um, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyway, uh, but we recognize um, that uh, sometimes, um, especially when you're in the position of a parent, um, that loving someone might express itself in different ways, right? Loving our children can express itself in different ways. At times, for me to be a good father to my children means that I show them grace and mercy and 
forgiveness. Yet at other times, we all recognize that the best thing that we can do for them is actually to enforce discipline or allow them to experience the, the pain of the natural consequences of their choices, right? Um, and uh, we see in Scripture both the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God, and yet at the same time, Scripture repeatedly teaches us that God actually disciplines those whom he loves. Um, this isn't because there's any delight in watching other people suffer or watching them experience pain, but we know that discipline is actually for our ultimate Good And so whatever we do, whether as parents or friends or whatever, we hope that what we do, our actions are done in love. Now, we don't always do that, do we? We don't always perfectly respond in love. Sometimes at home I snap out of frustration um, to my wife or to my kids when what is actually needed is patience and compassion because I am broken too. I am not perfect and so I don't perfectly love the way that God does. But today as we're walking through the character of God, uh, one of the most fundamental character traits of God is that God is is love. We find this idea repeatedly through scripture. I love in uh, 1 Chronicles 16:34 it says this, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his faithful love endures forever. See, this is one of the central characteristics of God. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you've probably heard that phrase before that God is love. And so it works out well that today we're going to be talking about the love of God um, as we're approaching Valentine's Day this upcoming Friday. And so for those of you guys who completely forgot that that was this week, you are welcome. Uh, but we're going to be in 1 John chapter 4 today, out of which comes that well-known phrase, God is love. Now in 1 John, um, John wrote this letter to people who were very, very close to him, um, and who were struggling with a, a handful of different things, and so he's correcting some theology, and he's, um, he's uh, doing a little bit of rebuking, doing some encouraging, but mostly, John wrote this letter um, to people who were very close to them to remind them to be obedient to God, and that we do this by walking in God's love for one another. So we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4 today. We've got a decent chunk here. Um, we're going to pick up in verse 7. And so this is a pretty decent chunk, but uh, just hang with me here, and, and here's what the Word of God says. 1 John 4, 7 starts out, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Now this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. And if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. And then this famous phrase, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love, but we love because he first loved us. And whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
and he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. And so we find this, um, this huge encouragement and uh, rebuke in some ways from John to uh, his, his listeners, um, but encouraging them that if we are followers of Jesus, if we are made in the image of God, if we are, uh, if we are claiming to have left behind our old life and living this new life as new creations in Christ, that we must love one another because God is love. But love is not God. Uh, Laura and I have been married for uh, 15 years now, um, actually as of this past October. So this upcoming Friday will be our 16th Valentine's Day together as a married couple. Um, And in those 15 years, I have gone through uh, really a radical reshaping of my understanding of love. And I think anyone who's been married for some time could probably say the same thing. Right? And by the grace of God, I hope that in 15 years from now, I'll look back on today and know that God has taken my understanding of love to even greater depths. Um, but here's this thing. Here's the thing. Over the last 15 years, I've learned more and more about what love really is and about how wrong the idea I had of love really was. And so I've had to completely relearn what I understood love to be. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, We have been trained um, in our culture through movies, through music, through books, through whatever. We've been trained in our culture that the idea of love is uh, mostly this emotionally driven thing, right? That the height or the apex of love is how we feel inside. And so the stronger we feel, the greater our emotions, then the greater the love must be. And so before being married to Laura, what I wanted most, what I looked forward to most was to feel love. You know, this idea that we're swept away and you can't help it. So we've kind of developed this Disney movie fairy tale version of love um, in our lives. And that's what our culture is lapping up and sets up as the highest standard of love. You know, this kind of love where the stars align when we meet together and everything is just, you know, absolutely just right. You know, the boy meets girl, they come together and, you know, she's always having a perfect hair day. And for some reason, the guy always has amazing teeth and they meet together and everything is just wonderful, all of a sudden the birds start fluttering around and music just pops out from nowhere and we start singing a song in perfect harmony with each other. And we get swept away in this love story, this romance, and then the next thing you know, an hour and 10 minutes later, and everybody lives happily ever after, right? Uh, We never have an argument. We always put our dirty clothes directly into the hamper and it's always magic all the time. It's romantic, and it feels good, and that's what we want. In fact, uh, we begin to see love as some outside force acting upon us, and we have no choice to obey. And so that's why we say things like, we fell into love. That's kind of a strange phrase if you think about it. We fell into love as if love is some sort of accident that has uh, a will of its own. Right, So we don't have any say in it. It just happens to us. We fall into it. We didn't choose love. Love chose us. Right? And all of this sounds nice, except that what we do is we slowly mistake love with things like attraction. And now love has primarily or even exclusively become an emotion that we feel. And so we chase this euphoric butterflies kind of a feeling and it sets it up as this feeling is more important than anything else. It's the most important thing. And yet, this emotion that we chase after, which is temporary, this emotion that comes and goes, is actually a poor substitute for a real and deep abiding love that God calls us to. Because think about this for a moment. If love is based on how another person makes you feel, then what does that mean? 
That means that your happiness, your satisfaction is completely dependent on somebody else fulfilling you, your spouse, your parents, your friends, whoever it be. And first of all, that is a huge burden to place on somebody else's shoulders. That your fulfillment, your satisfaction, your happiness depends on them. But secondly, chasing this feeling of love, chasing this emotion is not actually loving somebody else. You're chasing a feeling, and so ultimately what you're doing is just loving yourself. And so love becomes your God. Now, hear me well. What I am not saying is that there is something inherently wrong with the feeling of romance. Right? Just read Song of Solomon. Like, there's nothing wrong with this feeling of romance. It is a good and God-made thing. And I still get butterflies whenever Laura walks into the room, and I hope that I always do. But what I am saying is that the pursuit of this feeling alone, this setting up a temporary feeling as the highest standard, the, the apex of love, is a woefully incomplete picture of what love ultimately is, and it sets us up for failure. So after Laura and I got married, um, a lot of the assumptions that I was holding about love began to be challenged when this fairy tale presentation of love that we're being fed came face to face with reality, right? Because marriage isn't always butterflies and chocolates and roses and things like that. I learned that in marriage, um, oftentimes we love because we choose to love. Uh, you commit yourself to another person. This is why at wedding ceremonies, when we make vows to one another, uh, we uh, promise to each other to stand by one another. Because the reality is it isn't always health, sometimes it's in sickness. It isn't always for better, there are some days that are worse. And in these moments, we have to choose that I'm sticking by you no matter what. See, we see not just each other's strengths, but we see each other's weaknesses. We see each other at our lowest moments and our darkest times. And we say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for the long haul. And so sometimes love isn't just a feeling, but we actually choose and we commit to loving one another but also over this past 15 years of my life, I have learned more about God's love as I became a father to my children. And I'm not saying that I have loved perfectly, far from it, but there is something different when you are a father or a mother to children and you learn something about love. It takes on a whole new dynamic. And I learned that um, as a father, that I can't not love my kids. No matter what my children do, no matter if they fail, no matter if they don't pick up their room, no matter if I have to scream at them 17 times to you know, do whatever it is we told, no matter how bad they smell when they're young babies, no matter, how, uh, no matter what kinds of trials and temptations and, and what kind of things they put us through as parents, we can't not love them. That's why I've never understood when you see stories of parents who do evil things to their children. This is so foreign to us, right? Like, we don't get it, and the only way to understand this is to recognize that we are in a world that is completely broken by sin. Because as parents, you can't stop loving your children. Not because your children are always so lovely, but because it's in your very nature. And when I learned that, it completely and radically changed my understanding of God's love for us. But see, here's the thing. Because we have these conflicting pictures of love, um, we struggle even to understand it and to make sense of it. Because we're constantly being pulled in different directions and trying to chase these different things. I like how Matt Chandler, a preacher and an author, he points out, he says, we don't even have a good language for love, really. If you think about it, I can say in the same sentence, I love my wife, and I can also say, I love Taco Tuesday. And those are two different things, I hope, for you, right? And you might say, well, yeah, I get that, but we know the difference between saying something like, I love tacos, and between loving a person. And I'll give you that to an extent. 
But here's the thing. Uh, we can say, I love tacos, but also disregard tacos whenever we've had too many of them or we're full or we're bored with tacos or we aren't in the mood or when we see a cheeseburger and we think that it looks like it's going to make me happier and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is we've started treating relationships and marriages the same way. We say things like, well, you don't excite me anymore. I'm bored with you. You aren't as pretty or as strong or as skinny or as charming as you used to be, and I see something else that I think is going to make me happier, and so I'm moving on. And that's exactly what we've found in our culture. So don't tell me that we understand well what love is, at least not from our culture. And so why is it important that we talk about love? First, if we don't have a right understanding of what love is, if we don't have a right understanding of what love is, then we'll have no basis whatsoever for understanding God's love for us and then how we live that out in our own lives. This distorts our understanding. In fact, it even distorts our own relationship with God because we, if we begin to believe that love is based on a feeling or something outside of us, external uh, conditions, then when we've screwed up for the millionth time in our life, we begin to believe that our status with God or our relationship with him is in jeopardy because we think that God loves us depending on how we relate to him and not because it's part of God's nature. And so the way that we talk about love, the things that we are being trained to believe about love are in sharp contrast to what real biblical love is. Um, so here's what I want to do over the next couple of minutes. Um, I want to pull out three things that I find from our text uh, today about God's love. And then I want to look at what uh, Jesus taught about each of these things and how they are radically different from the picture of love that is painted in our culture today. And so I want to talk about these three things. The first thing uh, from our text today is this is that God's love, biblical love, God's love is initiating. God's love is initiating. Look at verse 7 of 1 John chapter 4 real quick. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So love ultimately comes from God. Love begins with God. It originates in him. And not only that, but look at verse 19. It says, we love, why? Because he first loved us. So God's love is initiating. God's love takes the first step. Now that's not natural to ourselves. We want to wait till the other person comes back to us, till the other person comes and apologizes, till the other person makes things right because we want them to fulfill us. But God's love takes the first step. <coughs> In Luke 15, uh, there were some religious leaders who were taking issue with Jesus because of how he was interacting with certain kinds of people because of how he was loving others, the outcasts, the sinners, the people who aren't worthy. And so as they're taking issue with Jesus, uh, Jesus, in only the way that Jesus can do, tells them a story, and you've probably heard it before. See, there was once this man who had two sons. There was the older son and the younger son, and one day the younger son comes up to his father and says, uh, Father, I'm done with all this. Why don't you just give me my share of the inheritance uh, now, and I'll be out, and I'll be on my way. Now, that may sound great as a kid. You know, you get your inheritance early, and you can use it however you want, but in this culture, that was a slap in the face. You might as well have said, Dad, I just, I wish you were dead. All that matters to me is your stuff, your money, my inheritance, and so give this to me now. And amazingly, the father actually does. And so this young man, he goes off and he ends up squandering his wealth and spending it on earthly, ple earthly pleasures of all kinds until finally one day he comes to the end of his rope and he realizes all the things that he thought was going to make him happy haven't. And he finds himself longing for 
pig food. He finds himself at the end of his rope. He's finally hit rock bottom. And so he says, here's what I'll do. I'll get myself up and, and I'll, I'll go back to my father and I'll, and I'll grovel before him and I'll say, Dad, I, I'm not your son anymore. I'm not worthy to be called your son. I'm not good enough, but if you would just make me like one of your slaves so that I, could have a ju- so that I can have something to eat, something, whatever. Father, will you please just take me back as one of your slaves? But if you remember the story, while the man was on his way, the father sees him and he runs out to the son and he embraces him with compassion and love and forgiveness. A- and my favorite part of the story comes in verse 20. It says this, it says, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. You see, the father didn't wait. He didn't wait for his son to get to him. While his lost son was far away, he jumped up, he hiked up his tunic, and he sprinted down the lane to meet him. In fact, if you read the whole story, you find out he didn't even let his son finish his apology before he was already calling for a celebration and was restoring his son back to himself. And this is completely radical. See, what his son did was absolutely unthinkable. He basically disowned his family and he squandered absolutely everything. Now, culturally, he should have been cut off. He should have been shunned by his family and by the whole community and maybe even stoned for his behavior. And that's exactly how everybody expected the story to end. But the father's love restored him and welcomed him home. In fact, he ran out to meet him. Uh, What I love about that is this. See, for a Jewish man to run would have been been considered shameful. To run was beneath your dignity. It's not proper for you to do. You know, it's like when you're a kid, you don't, you don't run in church, and when you're grown up, you don't run at all. You just don't do it. That's below our dignity. So to lower himself like that, to reach out to another person who's insulted him so deeply is crazy to imagine. But he reached out, and he restored their relationship. And it's important here to remember, church, and listen to this well. This isn't just a wild story about some man who loved his son. Jesus is telling this story so that we can know that this is how God loves you. He didn't wait for you to get everything fixed, to put yourself back in order, or to come back with a proper apology. As soon as the son turned his heart back to the father, he sprinted out and he beat him on the way and then ushered him back home into the family. Paul says this about God's love in Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, love makes the first move. To forgive, to sacrifice of yourself, to please the other person. And if we're going to love like God, as Scripture calls us to, we have to be willing to take the first step. So God's love is initiating, but not only that, we see that God's love is selfless. God's love is selfless. Look back again at verses 9 and 10 in 1 John 4 with me. It says this, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
See, this act of love by God is completely selfless, and it's entirely for you and for your good. It is for our benefit. Right? God doesn't benefit himself in any way by giving his son for us. It's for your good. Now, we live in a culture of give and take. We live in a culture of I scratch your back, you scratch mine. A culture that asks, what do I get out of the deal? One that says, take care of yourself first. Now, we don't want to commit to anyone or anything unless we know that it's going to somehow benefit ourselves. This is conventional thinking, and yet Jesus teaches us something radically different. In the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7, Jesus is taking their conventional wisdom, their understanding of morality, and he's flipping it completely on its head. He's saying this is not just an external thing, it's about the condition of your heart. And everything that they've known, everything that they believed, everything that they thought is now being completely flipped upside down. And in the middle of this passage, in the middle of this sermon, in Matthew 5, 43 for through 48, Jesus says this to them. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Because he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. But be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. See, perfect love isn't about what I get from you. It's not about how can you fulfill me. Perfect love loves even the ungodly. Perfect love loves those even who are enemies. Perfect love is made perfect when we love those who can give nothing back to us. Just as Christ who laid down his life for a sinner like you and me, what could we ever possibly what could we possibly give God? Yet God gave his all to us because God's love is selfless. selfless. God loves us not because we are lovely, not because we are lovable, not because we are worthy, not because we are good, but God loves us because it's in God's nature to love. It's who God is. But lastly, this, God's love is unconditional. Look at verse 15 with me. It says, if anyone, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. If anyone acknowledges. See, there's no stipulation on who is good enough. There's no stipulation on who is worthy. There's no condition on who you've got to be or what you've got to do. But instead, anyone who comes to God finds an open door and open arms. Now, this doesn't mean, as many people in our culture would try to tell us today, that we can do absolutely anything we want, and God doesn't care. It's all love, and it doesn't matter what you choose to do. No, we talked last week how God's goodness demands and requires justice. But anyone who would turn their heart to God is welcomed by God with open arms. Anyone who'd turn their life to him. And so we see that God's love is unconditional. In Luke chapter 10, a man comes to Jesus and he asks him, what's required of him for eternal life? So Jesus actually turns the question back on him, and, and the man answers well by saying that we're to love God and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus commends him for his good answer. But the man, we find out, wanted to justify himself. There was something broken in his heart, and so he asked, well, who is my neighbor then? In essence, he's asking, how far does love go? What are the conditions by which I'm required to love others? And so Jesus tells him 
a story. You've probably heard that one too before. There was a man who was down the road and he'd been, he'd been robbed and he'd been bruised and he'd been beat up by a gang of robbers and thieves who left him there for dead. And after a little while, a religious man comes by and he sees this, this person here that's unclean and, and filthy. And so he just passes along on the other side and keeps going his way. A little while later, another man does, another religious leader who should have known better, who should have had love in his heart, but he sees this, this broken man here on the side of the road, and so he passes along the way as well. And then finally, a Samaritan, a, a Samaritan, comes up to him, and he picks him up, he cleans him up, and he takes him, puts bandages on him, and makes sure that he is cared for. A Samaritan? Like, like he can't be the hero of the story, right? Maybe Jesus didn't realize this, but he's playing for the other team. Like, that's our enemies, and yet Jesus makes him out to be the hero of the story. You see, love doesn't require you to be a certain person or to be from a certain background, but anyone that would come to God is welcomed with open arms. And so there's no conditions on who we're called to show love to. But my favorite part of that story is that Jesus actually takes this one step further. In verse 35 of Luke 10, it says this. It says, the next day, he, that's the Samaritan, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. What he did was issued him a blank check. He said, no matter what it costs, no matter what I have to pay, I'll give whatever it takes because there's no limits to God's love. And so in this act, he was completely selfless. He took the initiative and he said, there is nothing that I won't do to show you love, no matter what. And this church is God's love for you and for me. God took the first step. He came to us and he gave fully of himself everything that he had without conditions, without limits. And he asks you, come home to me. God's love is greater than anything else that we know, anything else that we can experience. And God calls you through that love to come back home. I'll end with this. In Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul says this. He says, For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And for that church, we can be grateful. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, God, that you didn't require of us to fix ourselves or that you didn't demand that we, um, that we make ourselves right, that we fix ourselves up or any conditions, God, because we were completely and utterly helpless without you. But God, in your great love for us, you took the first step You moved towards us and you gave us your all so that we could have hope in you. Father, thank you for this love. And may we live out this love and show this same love to others, God, so that they can know uh, what a great and glorious God that we have. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.